In this video, I'll be discussing the effective nuclear charge and how it's related to periodic trends. The periodic trends I'll be focusing on here include atomic and ionic radii, as well as electron affinity. The goal will be not only to explain what the trends themselves are, but also why they arise. Let's first review the effective nuclear charge, or Z-effective. Imagine you're playing soccer with your friend. It's relatively easy for you to pass the ball to your friend without any issues. Now, as soon as somebody else is involved, say maybe an obnoxious younger sibling, it becomes a little bit more challenging for you to pass the ball to your friend. And the more people who are involved, the even more challenging it gets to cleanly pass the ball. Now, if one of these people represents the nucleus and another represents the valence electron, let's think about the attraction between these two. The nucleus is positively charged and the valence electron is negatively charged, meaning that those two objects are inherently attracted to one another. When the core electrons get involved, however, they uh, kind of block the valence electron from feeling the full attraction of the nucleus, which is represented by the ball being passed. It becomes more challenging to pass the ball with more and more interference. And this is what we refer to as shielding. The effective nuclear charge is, effect it is in summary how much pull the valence electrons feel toward the nucleus. And here we're focusing on the valence electrons. We could look at the effective nuclear charge of any electron in the atom, but the reason we're focusing on valence electrons is because they're most critically important to the periodic trends we'll be discussing today. So the effective nuclear charge can be approximated by considering the actual nuclear charge of the atom in question, as well as the charge that's being shielded by other electrons. For our lithium atom with a nucleus that has a positive 3 charge, we can estimate the effective nuclear charge for this valence electron in the 2s orbital. That can be done by taking the nuclear charge minus the charge that's being shielded by these two electrons in the 1s orbital. This produces an approximate effective nuclear charge of plus 1, which is much lower than it would be if the core electrons were not shielding the valence electron. This is related to trends in atomic radii. So here are um, some examples of experimentally determined values for atomic radii. The data for every uh, known element with its atomic radius on the periodic table can be plotted um, as this, so we're looking at atomic radius as a function of atomic number. Now what do you notice when you look at this plot? Well what I see are these kind of spikes in the data, and those spikes are, each spike is followed by a decay or decrease in atomic radius. Now if you're familiar with the periodic table, you'll notice that lithium, sodium, potassium, and rubidium are all alkali metals on the far left side of the periodic table and then helium, neon, argon, and krypton are all noble gases on the far right side of the periodic table. What this means, generally speaking, is that moving across from left to right on a single row of the periodic table, the atomic size goes down. That's a very interesting observation, so let's think about why that happens. So here we're looking at the data that I showed on the previous slide a bit more graphically. So here we're, we can observe that the radius increases as we move from left to right across a given row of the periodic table, and it also increases as we move from top to bottom down a column of the periodic table. So why does this happen? Why, does, why do we observe this trend? Let's think about it. Let's try to answer a couple of questions um, to get at this idea of why the periodic uh, trends exist. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video and consider not only what the difference in size might be for magnesium versus phosphorus, but even more importantly, why that trend exists. So pause the video and come back when you 
think you might have an idea. So when considering a single row of main group elements of the periodic table, shielding is effectively constant. If we look at the electron configurations for magnesium and phosphorus, you'll notice that both have neon as their noble gas core, which is a core of 10 electrons. So the valence electrons are being collectively shielded in both magnesium and phosphorus by those 10 electrons. So the nucleus of magnesium contains 12 protons, and there are two valence electrons, again, that are being shielded by these 10 inner electrons. So to calculate the effective nuclear charge, we would take the um, nuclear charge of magnesium, plus 12, and subtract those 10 shielding inner electrons for a total um, effective nuclear charge of plus 2. For phosphorus, you'll notice that it ha contains more valence electrons, which you might think would mean that it would be larger in size. But let's talk about why that isn't the case. So phosphorus contains more electrons, you're right, but it also contains more protons. Specifically, it contains 15 protons. When we subtract the 10 core electrons that these valence electrons are being shielded by, that gives us an effective nuclear charge of plus five. What that means is that these um, electrons, these valence electrons in phosphorus experience a much stronger effective nuclear charge than those of magnesium. What that means is that magnesium will be larger, and the reason for that is that its valence electrons experience a lower effective nuclear charge. This means that those valence electrons are pulled in less tightly to the nucleus. In other words, the electron cloud in the magnesium atom is is um, on average farther from the nucleus than that in phosphorus. Let's consider a single column of main group elements in this question. Which would you compare or which would you consider to be larger, fluorine or iodine? Pause the video when you think you have an answer, but also an explanation of why. So it's necessary in this case to consider the size and energy of the outermost occupied orbital. As you can see from the electron configurations given by the halogens in this graphic, the principal quantum number n increases moving down a column. We go from 2s and 2p to 3s and 3p and so on and so forth. What this means is that the valence electrons in iodide occupy higher energy orbitals than that in fluorine. So in fluorine, we have 2s and 2p, and iodine, the valence electrons occupy 5s and 5p orbitals. Thus, the valence electrons in iodine have a higher probability of residing farther from the nucleus than those in fluorine, meaning that iodine is predicted to be a larger atom. So this is answer choice C. Something we should touch on is how the ionic radius compares to that of the atomic radius. So one observation that's been made is that main group cations are smaller than their neutral counterpart. So here we're looking at lithium on the left within gray and the lithium ion on the, in the right in this dark pink color. You'll notice that the cation is much smaller than the neutral atom counterpart, and this is observed for all main group cations. To explain this, let's consider the difference between the neutral atom and the cation. The cation has one or more fewer electrons than the neutral atom. What this means is that now the electrons that, um, that are present, the fewer number of electrons in the case of the cation, are still being, um, are still interacting with the same number of protons. For example, all lithium species, whether ions or uh, neutral atoms, have the same number of protons. Um, in this, in the case of lithium, they all have, they all lithium species have three protons. So for the lithium neutral atom, this means that it's the interaction of three protons and three new, uh, three electrons. But as soon as lithium loses an, uh, 
an electron. Now it's the interaction of three protons and two electrons. So as you can imagine, the effective nuclear charge of those electrons increases, which causes the electrons to be more held, tightly held to the nucleus. We can apply similar but opposite reasoning to main group anions. In this case, let's look at oxygen first. So we know that um, oxygen, it, when it forms an ion, it most preferentially uh, gains electrons to form a two minus anion. You'll observe that the anion is much larger than the neutral atom. The reason for this is because we're adding more electrons to the valent shell of the, of the particular species. And what that's doing is that we have the same number of protons in oxygen and O2 minus, but now more electrons. So the effective nuclear charge of those outermost electrons has now decreased, which causes them to be less tightly held by the nucleus. So remembering these trends when you're comparing ionic size becomes important. The last trend that we'll discuss is electron affinity. And what this means is the energy transfer that's associated when a gaseous species, whether it's an atom or ion, gains an electron. And really, when we're looking at this, we tend to look at it in a kilojoule per mole unit, which means that the energy transfer associated with a mole of gaseous atoms gains a mole of electrons to become a mole of gaseous anions. And this process generally releases energy. And the more energy that's released, the more stability associated with the process. So what we're looking at are the main group elements and their electron affinities in kilojoules per mole. What we observe is when moving from left to right across the main group, we see a lower and lower, as in more negative, electron affinity. Now, of course, this is only a trend. It's not a definite, absolute must occur. It's simply a trend that we observe. The reason why this happens, why the numbers get more negative as we move from left to right, tells us that we're releasing more energy and the system is becoming more stable. Why this happens is that the effective nuclear charge is increasing, just like we talked about for our trend in atomic size. What this means is that when these halogens gain electrons, it's a very, it's a very stabilizing process, and we'll talk about why that is in another video. Um, but again, the main reason for why this trend occurs can be explained by the increase in effective nuclear charge when moving from left to right um, across a row of the periodic table. So our learning objective here was to define the effective nuclear charge and the resulting periodic trends of atomic and ionic radii, as well as elect electron affinity. Not only have we discussed what these trends are, but also explained why they arise. Here's a bonus practice problem you can try related to classifying uh, atomic radii. Be sure to not only choose the atom that's larger, but explain why it's larger based on the concepts we discussed in this video. Good luck, and I'll see you in the next video.